is going to talk to us about how to break the wall of disaster relief. In 2010, I was working in New Orleans after the oil spill. As part of the White House National Incident Command Team, it was my job to interview small business owners to find out how the spill had affected their day-to-day -day operations. It was here that I learned firsthand of the sharp decline in sales small businesses face after a disaster. So sharp that up to 40% never reopened. Now, the way government organizations tend to help small businesses in need is to offer them low interest loans. The trouble is, it's the wrong approach. The owners I had talked to were not interested in taking on more debt because they were already over leveraged. And if there are no sales and no customers, there's no ability to repay the loan. And while many of us want to help by donating canned foods or clothing or even sending money, there is no single avenue dedicated to helping small businesses. And that's why we created an online solution that directly connects small businesses in need with caring shoppers and customers. By targeting our purchasing power and buying goods and services from small businesses in distress, we're able to stabilize their sales. And eventually, they will survive and thrive. So, when you're ready to buy that handmade iron skillet or send that bouquet of flowers, you can spend the money you earmark for those goods and help a small business become profitable again. Here's how it works. Before a disaster occurs, small businesses will join the Recovery Pledge social enterprise platform. Then, after a disaster has happened, the marketplace is activated. And folks from all over the country can then redirect their consumption patterns to small businesses in need. We want to save the mom and pop shops of Main Street. And what's so exciting is for the first hand, for the first time, excuse me, the consumers will be able to follow the recovery process from the day they supported the small business to six to nine months later to the very day they received the good or rendered the service that they had purchased. It's an online recovery solution that connects small business owners, hard-working small business owners, with customers and caring shoppers. Now that's breaking the wall of disaster relief. Could you clarify how um, you vet the people who sign up so that they are actually the ones in the disaster area and so forth? that they haven't moved out and relocated, for example. Mm -hmm. And part of the process at Recovery Pledge is to make sure each small business is a good legal structure and also we re re review three years of financial statements. So we're going to lean on the Better Business Bureau and Dun & Bradstreet, but also we internally audit the small businesses that join the platform to make sure in the event of a disaster, they're willing to work as hard as they can to deliver on those goods and services that consumers purchase. Um, so the way I understood it, you said that they, they sign up before the disaster, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, the disaster occurs, and then, so I think there, I, there's two issues I have with it, is one, I don't know that there's, I don't see the incentive for them to join off the bat, unless it was tied into insurance. Mm -hmm. And then the second issue I would have is that once the disaster occurs, their fulfillment capabilities are not what they were prior. So how would you answer those questions? Mm -hmm. for, for the first question, um, up to, I think it's nine to 12% of small businesses actually have disaster insurance. Most small businesses have the least amount of insurance possible, right? And when they take on additional insurance, it almost doubles or triples the premium. And so we're this low cost alternative Right? Because we're leveraging the power of consumers to lend a helping hand and to stabilize the small businesses' sales instead of 
solely counting on government to offer low interest loans, or to wait for insurance premiums to actually show up, which in my, new, in my experience in New Orleans, it could take six to nine months for insurance money to show up. And in that time, the business is gone. And so we're this rapid response, right? And so by redirecting consumption patterns to the disaster area, and as a concerned consumer, right, you can, you can buy that handmade skillet, and you'll know in six months to nine months you'll get it, but by buying it today, what you've done is you've stabilized their sales. And we'll have a line of 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 customers out the door the day they open. And they know the customers are there because we've proved it to them. And I'm sorry, I forgot your second question. Fulfillment after the disaster. Great question. So insurance, if they do have it, will cover what's damaged. But it's not us to, to tell a business owner their fulfillment capabilities or their supply chain. I think you know our, we're a pass-through. And so what we're doing is we're lining up customers, we're stabilizing their sales, and we'll work with a small business owner, but I think it's up to them to really understand their supply chain and their network. And we'll help, but they're in business to make money and sell products and services, and we want to let them do that. Uh, a comment first that was really clear and easy to follow. Uh, question, how, do you, how can you contrast or compare this to crowdsourcing? Mm -hmm. so, so with Crowdsourcing, you tend to validate an idea. Um, if I'm a new young entrepreneur and I created a widget, I'll crowdsource it. And I'll throw it on a platform to see if it gains any traction. The small business owners we work with are already in business. So there's this validation that's already happened. And what we're doing is we're saying, in the event of disaster, we want to make sure you recover quickly. And so that's the difference between crowdsourcing and what we're trying to do. We're working with existing businesses we're already validated. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's give a round of applause for Chris.